Let me get myself on the. Um, Really? Good afternoon. Um, the public may not hear us very well because this is strictly for recording. So please come forward if you want to hear better. And let, can, you, can you hear back there? Okay. So we'll ask our commission to speak a little louder when you make your comments and speak into the mic for recording. <clears throat> For each case, there will be a public hearing. We ask that the applicant keep their presentation to under 10 minutes. They may reserve two minutes as a rebuttal. We ask that the public keep their comments to two minutes unless they have previously requested in writing for five minutes as a representative of a group or organization. Appeal of decision from the Historic Zoning Commission is pursuant to the provision of Section 2.68.030 of the Metropolitan Code of Laws. Notice is hereby given that a final hearing before this commission is appealable to the Chancery Court of Davidson County or the Circuit Court of Davidson County vis a situary writ of certiorari. You are advised to seek your own independent legal counsel to ensure that your appeal is filed in a timely manner and that all procedural requirements are met. <clears throat> you should also seek independent legal advice regarding the applicability of the writ of certiorari to the specific decision of the Historic Zoning Commission. So the consent agenda um, will be voted on at a single time. No individual public hearing will be held, nor will the Commission debate these items unless a member of the audience or the Commission requests that the item be removed from the consent agenda. So our first item on our agenda is um, the adoption of the agenda. However, um, I refer to Melissa Baldock, who is our lead from Metro Historic Zoning Commission today, as Robin is out of town. Um, are there any changes to the agenda? Yes, there are two changes. 2020 10th Avenue South, which was an application for demolition. That has been deferred at the request of the applicant. I anticipate it will be back on the August agenda. 2018 10th Avenue South has been removed from the agenda. Um, it was alterations to a previously approved infill and the applicant made changes that we were able to, to approve it administratively. Those are the only two changes. Okay. With those uh, changes, is there a motion to adopt the agenda? There has been a motion, there's a second, and so it has been approved. And are there any council members here this afternoon? Council member, all right, thank you. All right. And we will go for approval of last month's meeting minutes. Is there a motion? I move for approval. Uh, motion is um, second. second, and all in favor? Aye. 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 And we are passed. Actually, I didn't ask that on the approval of the agenda, so should I go back on that? I should. Okay. Um, let's. I'm sorry. Let's go back to the adoption of the agenda for the day. Um, there was a first. There was a motion. There was a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. All right. So, Sean. All right. Uh, we do have a consent agenda today. Uh, there are several items, and I'll go through each of those very briefly, and then we can make a motion, or you can make a motion uh, at the end. Uh, 1513 Woodland Street, uh, new construction of a detached accessory dwelling unit. Uh, 1022 Ackland Avenue, 
<clears throat> that's application of uh, an addition and outbuilding uh, with setback determination in the uh, Waverly Belmont Conservation Zoning Overlay. 1013 Paris, new construction of an addition. 1703 Forest Avenue, new construction of an addition. And 935 Silverdean Place, uh, that's also new construction of an addition. Staff has reviewed all of these cases and find that they meet their respective design guidelines and recommends approval of all of them as a consent agenda with applicable conditions that are written in each staff recommendation, finding that they meet the design guidelines of their respective overlays. Okay, thank you, Sean. Are there any questions? Okay. Do we have a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. It's a motion. There's a second. All in favor? Uh, okay, it is passed. Our first project is previously deferred items, which is 2801 27th Avenue South. Okay, Commissioners, uh, 2801 27th Avenue South is currently a vacant lot, and the application is to construct infill development. Here's the site plan um, shown in context with its neighbors. The proposed infill will meet all base zoning setbacks. Its front setback will be approximately 30 feet, which is approximately 12 feet forward of the historic house next door. Um, staff finds this to be appropriate because this side of 27th Avenue South does not have a consistent front setback line. You can see the house at 2807 is set really far back on the lot. And we thought that this um, proposed setback would transition from the house in the corner to the historic house next door at 2805. Um, so staff is supportive of that proposed front setback. Vehicular access to the site will be via a um, side driveway there are no there's no alley for this site so a driveway is appropriate um, there is an attached garage you can see here on the site plan it's at basement level and therefore meets the design guidelines the proposed infill is one and a half stories in height at the front it has an eave height of approximately 10 feet and a ridge height of approximately 24 feet 6 inches staff finds this to be appropriate it's very similar to um, the historic house next door it has a width of 28 feet, five inches at the front. Um, again, that width is similar to the historic house next door at 2805. Um, and towards the back, the infill does extend wider than the main form of the house by six feet, six inches on the right side. This wider part of the infill is two feet shorter and staff found it to be appropriate. The, um, again, here's the site plan again. Um, the um, the wider portion of the, the, um, of the house is pushed back fairly significantly on the lot. It's about 90 feet back from the front. Um, so staff, again, finds that wider portion to be appropriate. Um, you can see next door at 2805, the commission approved an addition that extended wider. So the form is not dissimilar to what will be happening next door at 2805. The site slopes towards the back of the rear, so there's an occupiable basement level. The infill includes an attached garage on the right side at the basement level, which does meet the design guidelines. Um, the proposed garage is in foot six feet from the main wall of the house, um, so it's kind of tucked in behind, which staff finds to be appropriate. Um, and it's about 57 feet back from the front of the house. Here are the side elevations. Again, you can see that side attached garage. Um, the foundation height is shown as a minimal at the front and gets taller towards the back because of the slope of the lot. Um, staff recommends approval of the foundation height and the first floor framing height to ensure consistency with the historic neighbors. The infill will have a depth of about 107 feet, not including the front porch, which is eight feet deep. Although that is deep, staff finds its scale to be appropriate because the lot is un un unusually deep and large. It has a depth of about 225 feet. Um, and is over 11,000 square, 11, square feet. All the known materials meet the design guideline and staff recommends approval of all final material choices. The, um, the side elevations do uh, include wall dormers, um, which staff is not typically supportive of, but because they're so far back in their inset, staff finds them to be appropriate. Here are some context photos. The, top, the house at the top is um, faces Woodlawn. Um, then the middle house is the um, 
house directly to the left of the of 2801 and then 2807 you can almost barely see it in the photo but that's the house that's pushed way far back in the lot um, and these are some of the houses across the street so in conclusion staff is recommending approval with these conditions that we approve the finished floor height um, we approve the front setback of and um, the windows and doors, the brick and stone samples, the material of the front porch and floor and steps, the roof shingle color. Um, we're asking for a walkway to be included from the street to the front porch and that there be four to six inch mullions in between the double um, and triple window openings. And finally, that um, staff approve the location of the HVAC. So with these conditions, staff finds the project meets section 2B1 of the Hillsborough West End Neighborhood Conservation Zoning Overlay. Thank you, Melissa. Do you have any questions for Melissa at the moment? Okay. Is the applicant here? Okay. Would you like to speak? All right. So for the record, the applicant is in line with the staff recommendation. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, open public hearing if there's anyone here to speak on that. All right. Close public hearing. Any discussions? Motions? Move approval with staff's recommendation. There is a motion. Second. There's a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, that's uh, unanimous. All right, thank you very much. Next one is 934 McFerrin Avenue. McFerrin Avenue is located at the northeast corner of Seymour Avenue and McFerrin Avenue in the Greenwood Conservation Zoning Overlay. The lot is 150 feet wide along Seymour and 168 feet deep along McFerrin. Historically, this was three lots facing Seymour Avenue. Currently on the lot is a circa 1948 house that does not contribute to the historic character of the neighborhood. MHCC staff issued a preservation permit for the demo of the existing building in March of 2018. <coughs> the applicant is proposing six residential structures, each with two residential units, for a total of 12 residential units. This meets the base zoning for the lot. In March 2018, the Historic Zoning Commission disapproved a similar but larger proposal for 12 residential units on the site. Um, this application does represent a revised um, design um, to get it closer. Uh, for approval. The proposed development will be largely oriented towards Seymour Avenue, which is appropriate. There will be three duplex structures facing Seymour. At the back, there will be three smaller structures also containing two residential structures each. Vehicular access to the site will be via a new curb cut and shared driveway off of McFerrin towards the back of the lot in between the two sets of structures. The driveway is approximately 22 feet, uh, 22 feet wide at the street. Typically, the commission is not allowed for driveways that exceed 12 feet in width, but because of the density of the lot and how many cars are going to need to get in and out, we felt that in this case it could be appropriate. Each unit will have attached parking, which again is not typically allowed for the um, front units, but staff finds it to be appropriate in this, instance, in this instance because of the density of the lot. The proposed front setbacks of facing Seymour are about 29 feet. This is forward of the neighboring houses at 846 Seymour. However, since 846 Seymour Avenue and pretty much all the houses on the 800 block of Seymour Avenue are non-contributing, staff finds that the proposed front setback is appropriate. The units will be a minimum of five feet from the interior property line and 20 feet from the rear property line. Along McFerrin Avenue, the new structures will be a minimum of 13 feet from um, the, the McFerrin side property line. Staff finds um, all of the setbacks to be appropriate and they also meet the base zoning. The units facing Seymour Avenue are largely spaced 10 feet apart. However, at the rear, the units widen and the structures are just six feet apart. The reason for the extra width at the rear is that the rear attached garages need a minimum width of 40 feet for four cars. Um, I'm not sure if you guys remember the discussion in March when this came to the commission, but the commissioners did um, indicate that they were okay with the extra width at the rear um, to allow for the parking. Uh, for units one, two, three, and four, the rear bump outs are, set, are two stories in height, whereas the main form of these units are one and a half stories. Staff is recommending that for these units, again, that's one, two, three, and four, um, so not five and six, um, 
that the extra width, that extra width where it's just six feet apart, be just one story and not the proposed two stories. And I'll show the elevations in just a minute. Um, for units five and six, the main form of that house is a two story form, so we're okay with the two story um, extra width at the back. So, um, so here are the three residential structures that are facing Seymour Avenue. Um, staff finds that their heights and scales are generally meet the historic context with a few exceptions. For units one and two, the main form of the house is one and a half stories. At the rear, the wider portion of the house, which is 40 feet wide, in order to accommodate the garage, is two stories in height. Again, staff is finding this 40 foot wide portion of the house should be limited to just one story, not on the upper story. Um, you know, we're only okay with the lower story because that's what's needed for for the garage elements. Um, these 40 foot wide portions are just six feet from the neighboring house. Keeping the wider base to one story will ensure that the height, scale, and rhythm of spacing of the development remains appropriate. Units three and four have a similar configuration and for you know basically the same reasons we're recommending that that um, two story portion at the rear just be one story. Or at least the wider portion of it just be one story. Um, for units three and four, um, it seems to be drawn that they share the same porch roof but have porch floors that are separated by two feet eight, eight inches. And looking at historic duplexes, either typically the porches share the same floor and the same roof or the porch roofs and the porch floors were entirely separate. So staff is um, recommending that the floor be a consistent floor line um, or if the architect chooses, he could also separate the porch roofs and have separate proof, uh, porch floors but we want them either to be in entirely you know, in line or entirely separate. Uh, we're also recommending that the front doors be at least half glass, which is a standard condition. Here's the McFerrin Avenue streetscape. So you're seeing the side of unit six and, and then also unit seven. The three year rear units are identical in design um, and staff finds that they are sufficiently subordinate to the Seymour facing structures and um, we are fine with uh, the designs of um, the rear units. We are asking on this McFerrin um, side that the horizontal window be either square or vertically oriented. And just here are some context photos. Um, the top photo is 928 McFerrin. Um, it's kind of the closest historic house to the south. Um, the photos on the bottom are the non-contributing houses along the 800 block of Seymour. Uh, these are looking, at the top is looking north along Seymour. Uh, and then on the bottom is 946 Seymour, which is a two-story structure. And this is kind of one of the larger structures in the area. Um, and um, staff finds that the proposed height and scale are similar to what, what you see around, particularly given this house at 946 Seymour, which is just a little bit down the street from, from the proposed site. So in conclusion, staff is recommending approval with the condition that staff approve the f finished floor heights. Uh, the rear portion of units one, two, three, and four be just one story in height. Units three and four have a continuous porch, front porch floor. Uh, the horizontal window opening at unit six be either square or vertically oriented. Staff approve a brick sample. Uh, and units one, two, three, four, five, and six have front doors that are at least half glass and staff approve all windows and doors. And finally, that staff approve the locations of the HVACs and the other utilities. So with these conditions, staff finds the pro uh, project meets session 2B1 of the de design guidelines. And the uh, architect for the project is here. Okay, thank you. So, so I have one question. Sure. Um, we've run into this before. Uh, it's an arts and crafts style. Some of these are arts and crafts style homes. and. Uh, and they are showing on the drawings uh, doors that do have glass, but it's about a third versus a right. half, which is more typical of what you see in art sure. and crafts. Um, the design guidelines say that the um, door should be half glass, but I think if the commission were, were okay with a craftsman style door, okay. staff would be okay with that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Melissa. Um, applicant? Not sure what. Good afternoon, my name is John Root with Root Architecture, 753 Alloway Street. Um, generally speaking, I think we've, we've been working on this project a long time, so um, I know there's some new members on the board, so I'll try to back up a little bit. We've, we've been trying very hard to um, find a solution that kind of intertwines this higher density R RM20 with McFerrin Avenue, which demands kind of a higher and, and more dense and more massing and coming down Seymour into a lower density situation. 
Um, I think we've been working with staff a long time, and um, I think what we've got here is pretty pretty close. Uh, we just, um, I think we agree with staff's uh, recommendations except for number two. Um, I just don't see how it's possible to reduce the height of the backs of the houses to one story um, on units one, two, three, and four. I kind of have, um, I don't really have a, personally, I don't really have concern about the height and massing of the, of the back of the houses because of the way we've treated architecturally the rest of the houses and how as you go into the lot, the massing and height of the homes get bigger and bigger. And finally, we, we terminate it at the back of the lot with these two story structures. So I feel like it's a nice transition into the lot. Um, and given that some of those scale items along Seymour Street kind of come down to the sidewalk, Personally, I don't really have a problem with, with the height of one through four. And we've, we've kind of squeezed and squeezed and squeezed, and uh, I'm not sure that my client's going to be okay with removing um, a, a large percentage of square footage uh, after we've kind of, we've cut all, we've trimmed all the fat, and we've, we're already cutting bone, and that'd be cutting a lot of bone out. So um, I think if, if um, I'm not sure what the next step is if, if, if we have a large issue with that scale in the back of those houses. but. Um, like I said, we wanted to come back to you because we've now got a solution for the sidewalk. We've got a definitive answer from Public Works about what the sidewalk actually needs to be. I think that was a big gray area in the last time we met. Um, they have agreed to a four-foot planning strip and a five-foot sidewalk, and that has a lot to do with uh, kind of the contextual response. There's some, there's some historic walls along McFerrin that they didn't want to tear out, and they wanted to kind of meet that ex existing context. And so we've, we've got that settled. That's what everybody agrees agreed to so we can we can put that on the on the wall and know for certain that is what we got to do so i think that kind of determined the rest of our setbacks and our spacing of our homes and of course we've pushed it as far back from mcferrin as we possibly could to give to give as much room between unit number six and mcferrin um, and we've generally speaking we've met the setbacks on the back units kind of in the same manner so um Right, I, I would prefer the Craftsman uh, doors to a Vic, more Victorian type door. Um, the, the corner unit is actually more Victorian in, in nature. I have no problem changing that one. I think that would actually be appropriate. Uh, but yeah, the, the units one, two, and three, and four are more kind of Craftsman style homes. And so I think, I think what we've drawn is probably appropriate. But um, I'm here for questions if you have any. And thank you very much. Thanks. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Um, we are opening public hearing. If there's anyone here, we are closed public hearing. Discussion with commissioners. One time, Melissa, again, about the, in the back, mm -hmm. about the, was that based on, and forgive me, you probably said sure. it was, I'll try to be loud, was that about the, uh, context of the houses next to it or is that why it was or was it just a, a massing uh, it's a massing issue I mean there's not really m much historic context along Seymour there's basically no historic context on this side of Seymour of McFerrin along Seymour um, I think the concern was that they're just six feet apart and that's pretty close together and we were understanding of the fact that at the rear there's the um, garages so there's a need for the extra width but we felt that kind of only being six feet apart and two stories in height was a little too much for the massing. Thank you. Well, all the commissioners are thinking about it. Um, just as a matter of admin, because we've got a different system, when somebody approves, I mean, when there's a uh, motion and then there's a second, do you want us to have the names, or um, who's taking the minutes? Just wanna make sure. It, would that be helpful? Yes. Yeah, like we would say, Commissioner, whoever yes. made the motion. Okay, yes. we'll. Okay. That'd be helpful. Thank you. All right. Well, I'd be interested in whatever the other commissioners have to say. I did some housing once that had the two stories, and it was even less, but it didn't seem too bad. I, 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 did, I felt pretty comfortable with it, but if. Uh, you know, if anyone has any other issues, that'd be open, but it was a, anyway, I had to do that, and it was two stories all the way back, and it didn't feel too, you know, too bad. So six, six feet was actually one foot more than I had, so. Yeah. 
Commissioner talks just a little bit louder. <laughs> Can you hear me? Sorry, it, okay. It's the, for recording as well. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. I, was, I was saying that um, I agree with what Commissioner was saying here in regards to having the second story in the back as well. So with all of the other recommendations I'm in agreement with except for number two saying that the one story needs to be in the rear as well. Yeah, I'm also, um, I think when I was looking at it, um, and I, uh, I actually, I drove by this property um, over the weekend, I happened to, so I made a turn because I remember this one, but uh, I think um, John uh, Root with Architect, they do a nice job, you know, of bringing it in towards the, in, you know, off the street, the, the bigger units in the back, um, the fact that there's not, you know, immediate context of, you know, a smaller, perhaps, you know, historic home right next door, you know, to make it seem out of, out of place, um, that is, you know, helping me, um, you know, generally like this design and, you know, the very subordinate units in the back that I know was an issue in a previous iteration of this, if I remember correctly, you know, so this, um, I think this is, does a nice job of, you know, hitting the zoning that, that they have for this property, you know, for how many units they can have um, in a nice uh, way. And um, I also kind of agree, you know, I'm not, I don't want to go against the guidelines, so I'm kind of weighing the, you know, the, the craftsman style door versus the guidelines say half glass, you know, I don't know if that was just kind of there, you know, so that's, that would be something, that'd be something I'd be more interested for the architect's answer, but you know, I feel, I would, you know, I think it would look nice if that's more fitting for that style of home, and I don't have a problem with that. Um, but again, y'all know more about that than I do. But um, yeah, otherwise I, 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 uh, I like this design. I think it looks um, nice for the area. As far as recommendation number six, staff's recommendation number six, um, one, two, and five and six already are showing, at least in the application I'm looking at, half glass doors. And so I'll reiterate that I think for Craftsman style house, uh, it's not as if there's no glass. It, it's, a, it's a door that's appropriate to the style of house. And mm -hmm. um, for that reason, I, I don't find it in, I find it appropriate for the fact that the application has chosen not to repeat the, the same um, style of house in each one of those which I guess could, certainly goes further to distinguish this and and help it fit into the neighborhood and the other styles that are surrounding so I, I would not have a, um, a problem with uh, approving those doors as submitted on units three and four at one-third glass I think what we're seeing with this application, as we see in so many, is just the increased density that we're seeing in Nashville for the infill properties. And I think because the applicant's done such a good job with trying to be respectful for the, to the street and keeping the streetscape and, and scale, uh, I, I really don't have an issue with the two stories in the back. I'll, I'll add that the absence, and I think I'm correct, the absence of an alley, you know, that they're on a corner lot on a heavily traveled street, the density is, is an issue of the base zoning, not necessarily of of um, something that the commission control. Right. This commission controls, and and I think in providing an access that has you know a more dense development, if you accept that from the front end, I think there's some things that come along with that. Were this mid block, it would be less appropriate, um, certainly, and there would be more effect to adjacent homes and neighbors but in this condition in this particular site I, I would agree that the massing at the rear is is um, not contrasting greatly and, and is appropriate for for the application other commissioners on that we've heard from I agree with the, the Smith. commissioner's general consensus okay. about the David? As do I. Story? Mm -hmm. Okay. So when we're looking at number two, then, where whoever is going to make the motion will make the adjustment on that? So, so Madam Chairman, with respect to uh, 934 McFerrin Avenue, I move for approval of the project uh, with uh, 
the conditions as stipulated by the staff with the exception of number two and uh, with the exception of the half class requirement. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Stewart has made a motion. Is there a second? Second. Um, Commissioner Boyd has made the second. Um, all in favor? Aye. Okay. And there is uh, no opposition. So um, with that said, that is, you've got that in notes. Okay. Thank you. Um, 114 Second Avenue South is a violation. Yes. All right. Um, so wall signage was installed um, without a permit, a preservation permit at 114 Second Avenue South. You can see it here. The signs were installed over boarded up windows, um, which you can see here on the right image. And subsequently, those signs were covered with plexiglass and new trim boards, also without a preservation permit. Um, 114 Second Avenue South was constructed circa 1910 and does contribute to the historic character of the Broadway Historic Preservation Zoning Overlay. Um, masonry repair was permitted administratively um, back in 2016, and uh, the existing the existing projecting sign was permitted administratively um, in 2017. <laughs> Um, staff finds that the location and material of the unpermitted signs do not meet the Broadway design guidelines. Uh, the windows were boarded up before the applicant uh, acquired the building. Uh, the signage, however, was, ins was installed over the boarded up windows without a preservation permit. And you can see here that the plexiglass that was installed over the signs along with uh, the, the trim boards, um, they were installed later um, without a permit after uh, staff notified the, um, the owner of the violation. So in the provisions for wall signs, the design guidelines states that a wall sign cannot be covered, or a wall sign cannot cover windows or architectural details. In this case, the signs cover the window openings and are inappropriate in the current location, uh, whether or not the, the windows are boarded up. Um, materials for the signs and trim were not provided. Uh, however, it's likely that the signage is either paper, vinyl, or cloth, which are not appropriate um, signage materials per the design guidelines. Uh, the plexiglass with trim, um, and the trim, again, is an unknown material um, that have been installed over the signs um, are not appropriate either. Plexiglass is not an appropriate uh, material for a window, and. Um, and the trim as, as, as installed um, would not meet the design guidelines uh, for a replacement window. Um, so in conclusion, staff recommends disapproval with the condition that the unpermitted signage be removed within 30 days. Finding that this project does not meet section four for signage, and just as a side note, um, your decision would not keep the applicant from applying for additional signage as they have not um, met their full allotment at this time, um, and it also wouldn't um, stop them or stop them from applying for replacement windows for those window openings that that do meet the design guidelines. Um, but but this would correct the violation. Okay, thank you, Melissa. Yeah. Is the applicant here? Okay. Please state your name and address as well. Thank you. Hi, uh, <coughs> my name is Brian Galati. I'm actually the owner of uh, Headquarters Beercade and what 14 Second Avenue South. So when we took this space over, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the address, it was falling apart. We had no idea what we were getting into. I'm from Chicago. This is our first venture outside of Chicago. We only have this location under one in Chicago. And we were met with a ton of issues. That ended up costing us a million and a half over our projected budget because the building was falling apart. Nothing met the standards that we are being met, we are being asked right now to comply with. Nothing met that. When I went back on the the images for like eight years, it was plywood, and no one said a word. It's a kitchen behind those two windows, and it has been a kitchen. As a matter of fact, when it was Bar Nashville, it was three different style windows. When it, it dates back that far, so we came in, we thought, well. One, the materials that we told in the beginning, which I think is a conflict of interest from the gentleman we were speaking with most of the time from Historic, is that if the materials came, basically all that wood, that's the reclaimed wood around that, that's actually the lumber that we took out of the space. That's 
70, 80 years old. So we were told that if it was something that obviously meets historic standard because it's material that was in the building prior to our existence, it's original to the building, it was an old chicken coop. So uh, we felt that by beautifying that portion of it, it was, ply as you can see, I don't know if you can bring that picture back, it was Home Depot slats of wood over plywood for, six, for five years. And so we thought, well, let's beautify it. Let's make it look better than the Home Depot slats that were up there. And again, it's a kitchen behind that wall. So I don't, we can't have window, and it's always been a kitchen uh, w while the windows were boarded up. So I couldn't pay the money to replace that kitchen and put it somewhere in the venue. Uh, so we decided to cover it up. Then we applied for a permit through Sign Me Up, and the permit was rejected because they said you can't block windows. And our response was, this has it, I took it over, it wasn't windows. It was literally the whole, there's no casing in it anymore, it's just, it was just plywood. So it, it had never been a window underneath my time there. I, I had been building that project for two years before I got it open, and I've been down here two years scouting the space. So for that long, I know, and then if you can, if, you, if the images were back up there, that's from Scene Nightclub, which is now four and a half years old. So again, the last time it had been a window was Bar Nashville, and again, those were three different style windows in every single one of those casings. One of the windows had plywood behind it. So I just, you know, I, I, we, we submitted for the permit, we said we'll do it right, whatever we need to do, and then like again, it was kicked back because it, it, they said it needed to be windows. To be honest with you, Everything I have is in this place. So I don't have money for, you know, extravagant new windows. And I, from my side, it's never been a window uh, as long as I've had the address. So I don't understand why now it has to be turned back into a window. So that's, okay. I don't know. Okay. Um, you can come back and rebuttal. Your full sure. 10 minutes is sure. not up yet. So if you just yep. have yep. a seat for a minute, um, unless the commissioners have a, a question for the applicant. Okay, not this moment. Okay, um, open public hearing. Is there anyone else to speak on this project? Close public hearing discussion. I'm just gonna change the slide. <laughs> I mean, uh, would, would the commission prefer that they take the sign down and put the plywood back up? Melissa, have we ever, have we ever, have you ha have we ever had a situation like this with the window opening, you know, but not, win you know, just the old building that right. just because it got run down, I don't know if that can I be an excuse for someone to not do something, but I'm just saying, yes, it is unfortunate, but, right. you know, I haven't had one like exactly like this before. I, I cannot recall, definitely while I've been here, I don't know if Sean or Melissa can think of a similar situation. I do know that, and I wasn't privy to the early discussions, but staff did not ask um, the, the owner to replace it with a window. Um, since they're, they unfortunately were boarded up, that could have continued, but um, any changes that were made would need to meet the design guidelines, which in this case would be a window since it's a window opening. Got it. Well, if we, if we, as a commission, decided that signage was appropriate there, do you have any idea about whether and you know, what square footage and how that would be treated? No, or I do not. That information was not submitted um, yeah. to us. So. At this time. I'll say our, our charge is a, yeah. a sign is a sign is a sign. Um, and that's what is present here. Uh, I think the trim around the sign, you could argue either, if you're trying to be a window, be a window. If you're trying to be a sign, be a sign. For us to split hairs over that, I, I'm, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure it matters. You know, any improvements that are made to the exterior should bring the building more into compliance, not less. And I think in the staff's analysis and presentation, we're not more, we're less. Um, there was not a requirement placed upon the tenant, user, owner, I'm not sure um, how the relationship works there, but I'm not sure it matters, that um, the existing condition be improved, I think to change it, you, you really, that's, that's when you come into the obligation of, of changing it towards compliance. That seems pretty straightforward and simple and that's how we've applied this in yeah. uh, all great. other situations, be it signage or not in this district and other districts. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I totally agree with that. Are there any other comments on that? I still don't think I understand what, could you explain to me, Ben, a little bit more about what, if we don't approve the signs here, what does the tenant do? Does he take the signs down and put something else back up if he can't afford the windows? Or I think I'd, I'd lean heavily on staff as to what would have to be done to secure the opening. Okay. Obviously, it's in, in operation if it were brought back to, um, and there were evidence of the way it was before, it certainly can't be a sign because that doesn't meet the guidelines. Right. I, I think to default to, well, I can only go this far, so I need more quarter than we're going to give to somebody else, that doesn't. No. I know. Doesn't I just, to, I just to, didn't know what, what yeah. they need to do to That's when I, bring it to, to. I don't, um, I, w I would lean on the staff to make recommendation or, or what they've done in the past. I, I don't know that specifically I have could, could, been involved in the scenario. Where is there somebody in the staff that could answer that oh, question? Melissa, can you well, help us I with mean, that? My option would be to install the windows. If, if the owner did that, there would also be the additional option to install signage behind the windows, as since signage behind the window is not reviewed by the commission. So um, that could possibly address both the signage issue as well as the opening issue and have it the kitchen obscured. I um, certainly understand that. Um, yeah. al alternately, I don't, since it was previously boarded up, I think that they could do that again um, to, to secure the opening. It wouldn't be preferable, but I think that would be an option. Sure. Yeah. Just, just for more clarity, so they've they've now applied for a permit, first signage permit. They, they submitted an application uh, to come before you today. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so they could still work with staff on making this compliant. Say again. Just not over the window. Just not over there's the window. There could be. A there's window. a fine line here that I want to. Maybe we should speak to. Yes. Which is, um, as Melissa said, it is permitted and, and it's done across Broadway to put signage, um, depending on the thickness of the window and the second surface, or it could be the fourth, depending on whether it's insulated glass or not. And that that wouldn't be reviewed. In this case, we don't have a window. Plexiglass with. Yeah you know, a, a, a reclaimed wood frame is not, does not a window make. And, and so I think in this application of those things, that's not a window. Right. And so the Right. Mm -hmm. I agree. And what the violation on is the un, unpermitted signage. Right. Mm -hmm. So what our purview is, is that it's specific to the unpermitted signage. And I, I was speaking further to a reapplication that this is a window with a sign in right. it or a yeah. lawyer's argument that it would be that or it could be that. If that's where mm -hmm. this is. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other thoughts? I mean, I'm going to, in regards to 114 Second Avenue South, I move to adopt staff recommendations that this sign be disapproved. Okay, Commissioner has made a motion. Commissioner Jones. Jones has made a, um, a motion. Is there a second? Second. And Commissioner Boyd has made a second. All in favor of the motion? Aye. Aye. Are there any nays? No. So we have unanimously passed that. Thank you. Um, yeah, all right. Very good. All right. Uh, next up is 3956. Um, sir, we had closed um, public hearing, so we're and they've made decision already, so we're we're done. The rebuttal is public Yes. Right. Right. So hopefully you can work with staff on on this on this project. Thank you.
next item on the agenda, that's actually the next three items, 3956, 3960, and 3964 Woodlawn Drive. I'm going to present them all together because they're related. Uh, and I do want to note that you did receive public comment about these. Um, they were emailed you to this morning. We did not receive any other public comment after I sent that email. Mm -hmm. So, sorry, I'm going to my notes. Um, so 3956, 3960, and 3964 are currently three lots, although until recently they were deeded together, so there was just one house on these three lots, and that house faced Endsworth. You can see the footprint on it here. Um, that house had the address 200 Endsworth. Here's a photo of it. Um, it was considered to be non-contributing, and staff has issued an, an administrative permit to allow for its demolition. Um, <laughs> So again, although the three lots had long been deeded together as one, when they were originally plotted for development in 1926, um, there were three separate lots created. Uh, the applicant has reestablished the lot line, so currently there are three legal lots. For more background, you can see that currently there's a triangular piece of land that actually belongs to 3964. Um, it was created back in 19, between 1929 and 1930. That was kind of to um, ease transitioning from Endsworth, which is here, to, to there. So that triangular piece of land is kind of unusual. It technically belongs to 3964, um, although it's not really developable. And that dates back to uh, 1929. So here is the proposed site plan for the development. The houses are all oriented to face Woodlawn Drive, which staff does find to be appropriate for several reasons. First, historically, houses were typically oriented towards the narrow side of the lot. And this is something that the codes department also requires, um, typically that, that um, when there's a narrower end of a lot, particularly on a corner lot, that that's where the house should be oriented. Um, for the lot on the right that face, that's um, at the corner of Woodlawn and Montgomery Bell, this one right here, um, it makes most sense to orient that to Woodlawn because there, Montgomery Bell Avenue there are no houses that face Montgomery Bell Avenue currently, so um, orienting that house to Woodlawn staff finds to be appropriate. Um, the middle lot, obviously, that needs to be um, oriented to Woodlawn because there's no other streets. Um, and then the lot at the corner of Endsworth and Woodlawn, um, staff finds it appropriate to be oriented towards Woodlawn uh, because, again, that is the shorter um, uh, shorter end of the uh, of the lot, which is what staff typically requires and what the codes typically requires. Um, it also would be difficult um, to kind of create a um, infill that has appropriate front setback from Endsworth if, the, if it was oriented towards Endsworth, because um, need, they need to meet the 15-foot side setback along Woodlawn. Um, also, and I'm going to slip ahead a little bit, sorry. Um, on the lot, there's currently on that lot at the corner of Endsworth and Woodlawn, there's currently a sewer easement, and the yellow is the current easement. The applicant, in order to be able to develop the lot, is relocating the easement, but you can see that it's kind of constraining where development can happen on that lot. Sorry, go back. All right. Um, so each lot will have a detached garage connected to the primary structure with a breezeway that is open on both sides. The commission has approved similar breezeways um, in, in the past. Um, so going back to this lot. So just wanted to show you a larger context map. So um, the three lots are in the boxed area. Um, the green area here is the are the boundaries of the conservation zoning overlay. So you can see that um, the houses on the other side of Montgomery Bell that face Woodlawn are actually outside of the historic overlay. Um, but there are historic houses on Kimpalong, which are on similar size lots. And then um, the lots along Endsworth are, are larger. So um, staff does have concerns about some of the proposed parking. There um, is no street parking at all, really, on Woodlawn or Endsworth or uh, Montgomery Bell. Um, so the applicant had expressed an, a desire to have some guest parking, um, some additional kind of uncovered parking. Uh, but staff felt that where the proposed was located was too far forward and too close to the front of the house. Um, so we've asked them to push it further back, kind of behind the back half of the house. And it's, um, I think, that, um, it's staff's understanding that the applicant has agreed to this condition. Um, 
So the submitted site plan for the house at the corner of Montgomery Bell and Woodlawn shows that the house at the corner um, is not meeting the 20 foot side setback from Montgomery Bell Avenue. Um, the applicant did not intend to ask for a setback determination. There was a misunderstanding about what the, the um, base zoning setback was. So they've agreed to shift it back so that the garage and the infill are meeting the 20 foot setback. Um, they'll be, even by doing that, they'll still have enough room to meet the 15 foot side setback on the interior lot. Here's the streetscape of the three proposed houses. Um, the houses are one and a half stories in height and in the range of 25 feet to 35 feet, which staff finds to be appropriate. The historic houses along Kimpalong are largely one and one and a half stories in height, while the historic houses along Endsworth are largely two stories in house height. Overall in the district, the houses range in height from 19 feet to 35 feet, I'm sorry, 36 feet. The houses will be between 57 feet and 72 feet wide. Staff finds this to be appropriate because the houses are on wide lots. Um, the two lots um, for 39.56 and 39.60 are 100 feet wide um, and then 200 feet deep, whereas the width, um, sorry, lost my place. <laughs> um, and the law on the right is 79 feet wide, but then it's kind of high shaped, so it does get wider towards the back. So staff found that the widths of historic houses on similarly sized lots on Kimpalong range from 50 to 60 feet, and staff felt that this, um, the proposed widths meet the historic context. Um, so on Endsworth Avenue, the uh, houses are a little bit wider because they're on much lar larger lots. So here um, is the front facade for 3956 uh, Woodlawn. Uh, this is the house at the corner of Montgomery Bell. The primary material for all the houses is painted brick with cedar siding or hardy siding accents. Staff finds this to be appropriate. Um, this house is brick to grade. Typically, the commission requests a change of material from the foundation to the wall above. For this house, um, the slope is such that the foundation will be, there will be a significant foundation, so um, the applicant has agreed to do a change in materials from the um, foundation to the wall above. Here are the side uh, elevations. Um, you can see the um, covered breezeway that is open on both sides, and then the um, garages. Um, so going back, um, the uh, houses are about 85 feet deep, um, which staff finds to be appropriate because the lot is 200 feet deep. Overall, the footprint of the house is approximately 4,100 square feet. Um, staff finds this to be appropriate because the lot is over 20,000 square feet, or is about 20,000 square feet. Um, therefore, staff finds that the um, height and scale of the proposed infill meets the historic context. Here's the front facade for the middle lot, 3960. Um, in this case, the applicant is showing brick to get grade as well. Staff is okay in this instance because it's set down lower and because of those wing walls, um, we felt that the brick to grade and because of the, the bays that it wouldn't be a long wall, that a brick to grade would be appropriate for, for this facade. Um, the, it's, uh, it's 57 feet, two feet, two inches wide at the front and we'll have a maximum width of 63 feet further back. Uh, the infill will have a maximum depth of 80 feet on the right side, which staff finds to be appropriate again because this lot is 200 feet deep. Um, the overall footprint is 4,000 square feet approximately, and again, the lot is over 20,000 square feet, so we felt that this um, size was appropriate. And here is the house at the corner of Endsworth and Woodlawn. Um, the infill is proposed to be 56 four inches wide at the front. It expands wider um, as it gets towards the back, which is, matches the lot. It also kind of um, allows them to meet the, um, the new sewer easement. Um, staff finds the, um, let's see, the, so it'll have a maximum width of 72 feet, but you can see it's pretty far back from the main front of the house. Um, so the main part, the, this lot is 79 feet at the front and extends to be 200, over 200 feet at the back. Um, the large width of the lot at the rear makes the proposed width of the infill appropriate. Um, like the middle lot, staff is fine here with a brick to grade because this one will also sit fairly low to the ground. Uh, it'll have a maximum depth of 77 feet, and again, the depth of the lot is 200 feet, so staff's okay with that. Um, the overall footprint for this house is about 4,249 4, square feet, and again, this lot is 28,000 square feet, so staff finds that the footprint and overall height and scale is appropriate. Um, so again, here is the sewer um, easement. The yellow is what's there now, and the pink is how they propose to relocate it. 
So um, for all three houses, staff is recommending approval with our standard conditions about uh, approval of the finished floor heights, that the cedar siding be smooth, the stair and floors of the front and side stoops be wood or concrete, staff approve the brick sample, wood shingle, color and texture and all windows and doors, and that staff approve the HVAC and other utilities. Um, for just 3956 Woodlawn, staff is recommending these additional conditions. Um, one, that there be a change of material from the foundation line to the wall above. Um, two, that the guest parking area be located to the back half of the house. And three, that the infill and outbuilding meet the base zoning setbacks of Montgomery Bell. Um, the applicant has agreed to those conditions. And for 3964, there's an additional condition that we want the guest parking located at the back half of the house. Um, and again, the applicant has indicated that he is okay with that. So with all these conditions, staff finds that the proposed infills and outbuildings for 3956, 3960, and 3964 Woodlawn meet Section 2B of the design guidelines. I know that there's public comment, um, yeah. um, but happy to answer any questions. Sure, yes. Commissioners, any questions for Melissa at this moment? Uh, so one question for you. Um, for the front setback from the street onto Woodlawn, mm -hmm. how is that determined and what, what was it determined? Because, let me go back. Um, because in the district there really aren't any houses that face Woodlawn, um, there, we didn't think that there was much of a historic context. There are the houses across the street on Montgomery Bell. Um, those are deeper lots, and so they have a deeper front setback. So um, I think codes requires 40 feet, um, and that's what we, we felt that to be appropriate because there really wasn't much to compare it to. Okay. All right. Um, the applicant, please. Uh, my name is Chris Goldbeck, and I'm with Pichet Design. And I'd like to start with just a question. And your address, please. Uh, your address, please. My home address or yeah. work address? Whichever one you want to say. Okay. Uh, work address is 236 Public Square, Suite 201 in Franklin. Okay. And Thank you. is each of these houses going to be discussed and voted on individually, or are they going to be handled collectively? Uh, um, Melissa, you're recommending that we vote this all three, or because there are specific ones to each each I property. Think, I mean, I think it's up to the commissioners. Um, you know, I think there are some issues that are specific to certain houses, yeah. so it would be worth it to discuss it individually. I, I think that would be worth it to yeah. discuss individually. Okay, and, thank you. Okay, very good. Okay, and I don't know that I have uh, a whole lot to add to the staff's uh, report and recommendation. Uh, we're agreeable to all the conditions that were set forth. And certainly appreciate Melissa's help in getting us to this point. It's been a very cordial and informative process. And my experience with these sorts of meetings is they go best when you find out what the rules are and you follow the rules and you get the staff on your side. And so when we sat down with staff on the front end, it was really just telling me everything about house orientation, tell me about setbacks, tell me about garage locations, driveway locations, height of the garage ridge, height of the garage eave, um, how far it has to be set back from the house. Uh, tell me about the width, the height, the massing, uh, window patterns, window grid patterns, all that. And so with all that, we sat, sat down and designed it and we um, tried as best we could to follow the rules. And so we're here today not asking for anybody to break the rules, not asking to bend the rules. Um, we, it's our hope then that the uh, commission would vote to affirm uh, the staff's recommendation for approval uh, with conditions. And I assume we'll talk about 3956 first, at the far right. Okay. Do you have a comment on the 3956? Yes. Okay. Yes. And uh, not a whole lot to point out here. Um, as was discussed, the front setback we were provided with was 40 feet. Uh, we've pushed it back to around 53 feet uh, just to get it further back from the street. Um, still, it's a good size lot and we have a, a good size backyard. Um, I did have the opportunity to meet with uh, Council Lady Murphy and some of the neighbors last Saturday. And uh, it was a very well run and well attended meeting. What could have been a contentious meeting, I think, provided a lot of information and expressed or gave people the opportunity to express some concerns. And on this particular lot, there was a concern about, especially from the neighbor, uh, Mrs. Newton, who lives across the street there, um, about curb cuts and that she's going to look at a, a three-car garage um, on the Montgomery Bell side. And the garage is really out of our control. That's where we were told to put it, so we put it there. And it's going to more or less mirror 
her detached three-car garage on the side. And then with the issue of guest parking, uh, we're fine with pushing farther back. Uh, as was mentioned, there's an issue with how do you get to your front door? If we have to have all three houses face Woodlawn, we need something a little bit close to the front door so you're not parking all the way back at your garage and having to walk all the way around your lot to, to get to your front door. And so we are requesting to get the second curb cut for guest parking here uh, along the back half of the house, as was indicated. Um, and outside of that, I don't have anything to add for, for this particular house. And uh, I'd like to reserve my time for rebuttal. Okay. Um, just, commissioners, do you have any questions for the applicant at the moment? Okay. All right. We're going to open public hearing. Council member? Okay. All right. Uh, yes, sir. Would you? Um, because we're going to do 3956. I mean, unless you want to do a general comment, but we're going to vote on each one separately okay. because they have specific conditions to them. So we want to be clear for the staff. Um, yes, exactly. I mean, it sounds like if we're going to vote on one specifically. Oh, I'll ask. Yes, legal. You could actually hear public comment for each one of them, mm -hmm. public comment time together, but when you take um, action, you just need to vote on okay. each one separately. So, so if it saves time for everybody to okay. kind of come up there and just identify which one they're speaking on okay. for the record and so that you all know what the comments are pertaining to, then that can work too. Okay, so we're going to clarify that. So public comment is going to be for all three so we can make um, some time efficiency there, but the board will vote on each one separately. Council member. So this is a good spot to, to yes, sir, make a brief is. comment. Thank you. Uh, thank you, and I'll make a comment about all three lots. I'm John Cooper. I'm a council member at large, but I'm a, really a neighbor further down on Woodlawn. And Woodlawn um, has been through a lot, um, both within the historic overlay and outside of the historic overlay, on setbacks. Mm -hmm. And particularly, there's a very prominent case uh, just a block away um, at Estes and Woodlawn where a separate overlay was invoked to get the right setback for that lot because Woodlawn, a challenged street in modern developing Nashville, is very proud of the consistency of its houses in the row. And people have really invested a lot of money to keep the sort of historic feel of that street going as long as it can. So my question for you all is, it, you all were extolling the large lot sizes for this. The staff was saying, boy, these are big lots, we can have these big houses. I really feel that, that to the neighborhood, that is a great use of your overlays powers to, to enforce the same setback as down the rest of Woodlawn. You know, that, that, that that's really very meaningful. And a lot has gone through uh, within the last year. Council Lady Murphy has been our champion in doing this in enforcing a consistent setback down the entire street. And, um, and I would just urge you to do that. And then secondly, there really are no entrances on Montgomery Bell from this side. You know, that, that is really a sealed off street. Um, I do have, I'm there every day during the school year. That's a challenging street several times a day in terms of traffic. And so I think just being very aware of that uh, and keeping the consistency of that is also another goal that, that you all should delve deeply into. But my real point is this, I mean, I can't tell you how many community meetings there have been, how many appeals, how many lawyers have been involved in the setbacks on Woodlawn all the way through really going down to bowling and then up to Ensworth is how we're feeling is the Woodlawn community. Now, some of it is technically in this historic overlay, but you've got setbacks right across the street and they need to be, uh, and all those houses are very geared to that and don't have this jarring moment where you change setbacks because of some artificial, artificial line. But with that, again, I, I 
to the rest of the neighbors, but I did want to come and I appreciate everything that you all do and this is completely not easy. Um, but again, if the lots are so big that you're able to have three where one used to be, right, then the lots are big enough to have the right setback. Thank you. Uh, Councilman Cooper? Thank you. Yes, sir. Do you know what the setbacks are, the, the sacred setback that you I have? don't, but I bet your staff could find that out. Okay. Thank you, Council Member. Hi, I'm Glenda, can you hear? Glenda Bell Newton, and I live at 3950 Woodlawn, which is on the corner of Woodlawn and Montgomery Bell. So I will be directly affected. Um, I can't tell you how many of my neighbors have called and aren't here today because they just see that this is a done deal and they've given up. I don't feel that way. Um, it should come as no shock or surprise to anyone that we are all saddened and sickened and shocked and dismayed by this proposal because we want to see one house there. That's just what we've worked so hard to preserve our Woodlawn estate lots. That's why we got down zoned with Kathleen. We're not taking, I, I'm just telling you that's how we feel. If a person is zoned and has the right to build three houses, then we're going to have to accept it because that's legal. I offer up to you, is that the right thing to do if you all approve this? Is this a, is this a development that you're going to drive by and go, boy, I'm proud we did that? I don't think so. I implore you to look at Woodlawn and the houses that outline Woodlawn from Innsworth on down to Bowling. You're going to see humongous setbacks. You're going to see tree line lots. You're going to see the people that live there value not just the land, but the beauty of the land and ensure the quality of life that we have gone to great lengths to preserve. Um, this is not 12 South. This is not Midtown. This is Woodlawn, and we just hope you respect that. And keep in mind, there's not one driveway on that side of Montgomery Bell Avenue. The foliage that is there now has been the streetscape forever. I've been there since 84 and I'm a founding member of Woodlawn Neighborhood Association. I appreciate your time and your respect very much. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. My name is Mandy Young. I live at 132 Innsworth Avenue, which is the dead end side of Innsworth that's impacted by this. And I submitted comments on behalf of my husband and Stephen and I. We moved to the neighborhood eight years ago. I'll make a couple of comments quickly and then he'll follow up. As it relates to 3956, as Bill said, there's not a driveway on MBA on that side. In addition, MBA and Woodlawn have two schools impacting it. And I hate to say this, I had two boys that went through Montgomery Bell Academy. Teenage boys and their brains do not work and that makes them really bad drivers. You add that to Innsworth um, Elementary School, which is at the end of Innsworth Avenue here, and there's a slight hill on Woodlawn, and this is a very dangerous in intersection. So when you add a parking um, egress at the end of MBA, you're adding to traffic concerns and additional wrecks that already occur there. Um, I'd like to also point out that um, if you do to 3964 and you orient it to Woodlawn because that's the staff's recommendations because someone created a rule that you oriented houses to the shortest um, property side, it will be the only house on Innsworth Avenue of only nine houses that is not oriented to Innsworth Avenue. It will be the only one, and it doesn't have a side view of 3964 that's an appropriate side of a house when all other houses are oriented to Innsworth Avenue and on Innsworth Place, both of which are dead ends. Innsworth Avenue um, goes to um, Harding Road, but is dead ended there. I took some pictures, and there's two of each house. These are the two houses most impacted by, um, that one is directly beside the Gober Park, it's the same house. That's directly beside, and this one is across the street. And those show you the setbacks that are on Innsworth Avenue. So if you don't put a setback on 3964 further than it currently is, it doesn't fit the neighborhood or the, or the style of the historic overlay in which this sits. 
Finally, one other point I wanted to point out to you is Innsworth Ms. Avenue has two entrances, and therefore you could close Innsworth okay. Avenue. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, good afternoon. I'm Stephen Young, 132 Innsworth Avenue. I'm an enviable spot of following my wife. For those of you who are married, this is very difficult to do because she's pretty much summed it all up. I'm going to concentrate on 3964, uh, where the diagonal street is, and there are nine houses that are down Innsworth Avenue. Our house is one of those, okay, including this Gober house that is there now that's um, in particular interest to us today. All of those houses have large setbacks, and I hope some of you are personally familiar with that street. And to not have the entrance to that house facing Innsworth will be an anomaly. It'll be an oddball. It'll be, it'll be, it'll be very odd. Innsworth Place runs on this far side of Woodlawn. It has equally about nine houses. They're all large setbacks, and all of them face Innsworth Place. So this is a very elegant street. It has wonderful history. Our house was built in 1925 by the Basses. Mr. Bass is about 105 years old. He works at Bassberry and Sims. He remembers growing up there. We've interviewed him about the street. There really weren't any houses there hardly, very few. It burned to the ground in 1930 and they built it back exactly the same. That's when you know you built something right, when you want to build it back exactly the same. But I just ask you to really understand the neighborhood, the history of it, the elegance of it, the setbacks of it, and especially for that one lot, that it must be like the rest of the houses or it will be different, it will, not, it will stand out, it will not be acceptable on that street, and uh, it will be odd if you don't have it facing Innsworth Avenue. I am not in this area like you all, and you grapple with these things all the time, but that side angle street, I would think, doesn't necessarily have to be there. You could gather property by having it go away and then have just a straight part of Innsworth Avenue. Thank you for your time. Thank you. My name is Tom Pennington. I live at 202 Craighead Avenue, and my family, of which I'm a part, also owns property on 3700 Woodlawn Drive. Um, I rise as a, a disinterested uh, resident and citizen of the area in favor of this development. I think that developers who come in and abide by the rules and uh, observe the conditions of the conservation overlay uh, should not be unfairly impeded in developing and exercising their rights to develop the property um, that they have. Uh, my understanding is that this, this is not a subdivision. Nobody's asking for approval of the three lots. The three lots are there. And they've been, the design has been carefully considered, well thought out. It definitely meets all of the guidelines that I'm aware of and, and exceeds some of them. Uh, so I, I think that the commission should uh, give the bias in favor of allowing this to go forward with the re staff recommendations as is, uh, because uh, it's the right thing to do. And when people do, do the right thing, they're entitled to have the right thing done by them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Before I start my comments, I've got a question for staff that they can answer it. I've got a little confusion between the staff report. Um, the there is a the, y'all talk about changing the the sewer easement. Is that the sewer easement? Does that have to be abandoned and go through council? That I don't know. The applicant might be able to answer that, but we don't deal with sewer easements, so. Okay, because the so I think this is important for y'all to to know this going into the conversation. Um, for a few reasons, and I'll touch on it now, and I'll come back to it. Is so if can you can you flip back to that slide with the easements on it? Um, oh, or I could, <laughs> but I'll might break it. Thanks. Usually we have one open. Yeah, that's right. Perfect. There you go. Okay, so looking at this easement, so 
I, I just picked up on this today. Otherwise, I would have I would have done a little bit more research, and my phone's dying, so I didn't have a chance to call over to the council office or public works to figure this out. So, if there's an easement. Typically, to abandon that easement, that's something that has to go through the Metro Council. Um, and so I think that is key before you decide on this lot is we need to know if this is something that has to go through Council. Because if you all approve it and it comes to me at Council, then, then I have to make the decision of whether to abandon this and allow it to be shifted over or moved. Um, and so it's kind of hard for me to necessarily give you all too many thoughts on it other than I think this house is oriented wrong because if that's got to be abandoned or go through the council, that's definitely something you all need to know before you vote on this on this home and move forward because otherwise you might approve something that, that can't move forward without council action. Um, and so I will, I'm assuming, I'm going to hopefully not break this. I've gone the wrong way. I'm sorry. I did break it. I did. I'm sorry. I went the wrong way. I'm trying to get back to the main. There we go. Okay. So when talking about the one on the end, so Mr. Gober um, and, and Mrs. Gober have been great and involved in the community for many years. When I was first getting um, running for office, we met. He's a longtime friend of my father's. And he was telling me the story about when they moved in here, how the grass grew up on that triangle. And he complained to the city about, why are you not cutting this grass? And the city told him, well, you actually own that, sir. Congratulations. And you've been paying taxes on it. So <laughs> he talked to me about maybe we should, could get Innsworth Avenue closed for him so he could, could kind of reattach his property there. And so it's been interesting in the concept, context of knowing that story and knowing how long that they've lived in this home um, because this is an area that, that I grew up in as well. Um, and just as an example to follow up on, on Mandy Young's comment is Montgomery Bell at this stop sign. I ran into that stop sign in high school not being the best driver either. I mean, this is an, I, I know this area well. It's not just my council district, but it's an area I grew up in. And so for since the beginning of these lots, this everyone has thought that these three lots were one lot. And I even did the research myself, and, and that history degree is paying off when I, I researched the deeds next to it. And the homes, interesting enough, um, going up Innsworth Avenue, similarly used to have these lot lines. But they had been consolidated and shifted over the years. But for whatever reason, the Gober property, what we're looking at today, never shifted. Um, and that's something that uh, is, I guess, consoling to the neighbors that this isn't going to happen again, that we pop up and have random three houses where we had one. But I think it's interesting to note that the Gober house was not situated on one of these lots directly facing one way or the other. It was kind of catty-cornered over this, it's lot five and lot four, I believe, and it kind of angled facing Innsworth Avenue because that was, I think, the most appropriate way is that the house faced where the address was. If you look in the staff report, it describes this property as being at the corner of Montgomery Bell and Woodlawn. And I don't think that anyone um, in the neighborhood would describe it that way. This property is at the corner of Innsworth Avenue and Woodlawn. And so when you take it into that historical context and the context that the neighbors live with every day, there's no doubt that the home that is split in half, the, the 9364, should at least be catty cornered or facing Innsworth. I think that's a given for most of the neighbors. Um, I think it's very disruptive that where the home had been facing Innsworth, the home across the street, which is the Maulers, who I remember when they moved into that home because we went to my brother and I went to high school with them and 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 their sisters. Um, it also faces Innsworth. It doesn't face straight onto Woodlawn. And so the concept that this should be a Montgomery Bell and, and Woodlawn focused development is, is, is just not simply accurate or historic in our opinion. Adding the curb cuts, secondary parking, just because they need guest parking. People park on Montgomery Bell for, for the ball games at the high school. So there is guest parking that could be done. Um, again, not necessarily recommended with all the high school drivers in the area. And Innsworth is wide enough where you could have guest, guest parking. So the amount of pavement and parking added here and curb cuts is simply excessive. Now, I'm not going to get into necessarily the, the strict architecture of the homes because I think they're lovely. I wouldn't mind living in a large home either. But I think that they are too large for these lots given the context of the area in this overlay. I understand that staff will tell you not to look at the rest of Woodlawn's character. And if you're going to throw out the rest of Woodlawn, what I don't think you can throw out 
is Innsworth. Again, you're being asked to throw out Innsworth simply because a house is not facing there. And I think I've made the argument that a house should be facing Innsworth. If you go back to the address of this home, the Gobers lived at 200 Innsworth Avenue. So I, I think that, that these are lovely homes. I think that we could get to an agreement, but the fact is, is the way that our system is set up with the overlay is that council members are notified of, of these homes and plans basically once they're down the pipeline, right? And, and we are very fortunate that we have an overlay here because otherwise they could have, the developers could have just pulled the permits and, and started moving dirt. And we did have that happen down the street next to Councilman Cooper's house and we had to go to the BZA and we we went back to the BZA over and over again and, and fought over a setback and it ended up in a, in a zone change for I would say the bulk of Woodlawn Avenue um, because of what was happening literally to I guess not even a whole block face down from here. So in summary I think these houses are too big for the lots given the character and the context of Innsworth Avenue. I can understand if y'all want to throw out uh, parts of parts of Kimpalong when you're looking at scale and massing in comparison I can see throwing that out because those are smaller lots and it is a separate street um, but I don't think you can throw out Innsworth and I don't think that I don't think from a planning or historical perspective you can say that these homes match and fit Innsworth Avenue so what I'm going to ask y'all to do today either is to defer this all together because we need to know about that easement um, or you, you could disprove it too, but uh, I know we, we need to keep working on this. I don't think we're there yet. I think that um, we need to have some more community input because while we were cordial at, at our, our very last minute community meeting, um, a lot of those neighbors expressed to me concerns about why do we have an overlay if we keep being told it just doesn't apply here because this is a new block face. Um, if you create a new, I mean, it just, it's just not, it's, it's a square peg in our round hole today. So I'm gonna ask y'all to defer this um, based on the easement information that we definitely need to find out because I, I don't wanna give a black and white answer here, but I think if this were to approve and come back to council, I think we're gonna be back here because I don't think I'm gonna be able to move that easement without a little bit more support from the neighbors. I think we need to seriously look at the multiple curb cuts on Montgomery Bell and if there are other ways to make this work. And then as a side note, I'm not sure if you're aware how much this impacts y'all with the overlay is that they have filed at the BZA for a sidewalk variance um, to not pay for the sidewalks and not put the sidewalks in. And that, that kind of rubbed neighbors the wrong way too. Um, I understand that there is a row of trees here, but I'm pretty sure when you buy a a multi-million dollar home, you're gonna take out the hackberries. So the hackberries are probably gonna come down, and so the fact that they're asking for a sidewalk variance too, I think rub neighbors the wrong way. So I'm happy to answer questions, but but the, the kind of summary I've got is that I think I think this needs to be deferred. I think we need some more input from the community before it moves forward. Okay, thank you, thank you council member. Um, Sir, yeah. I'm happy to answer questions. I'm not as familiar with the neighborhood as, as you are. Where are there sidewalks adjacent to these properties? On what streets the sidewalks? There are currently no sidewalks adjacent. And the and the the variance and again that we don't have a BZA date yet, but they are it's my understanding they're being um, required to put sidewalks on Innsworth, Woodlawn and Montgomery Bell and the the request is to not pay the in lieu of fee and not to build. Okay. And the hardship is that there are trees there. But again, when you build homes like this, I'm pretty sure you're going to take out those hackberries. And that was one concern that came up at the neighborhood meeting um, was there's a, there's a home right up there. Um, and they're used to seeing the side of a home and now they're going to be having, you know, car lights, you know, coming through their windows because of the way these homes are oriented and the way the garages are. Um, and, and without seeing some kind of for sure landscape buffer, that's a huge concern for us too. Mr. Tips. On the, the diagonal street of Innsworth, was there any other comment, any other uh, movements, I guess, to get rid of that street or close it off, or where did so, that end up? Interesting enough, that street's been there. I think what did your staff report say, like since the twenties? Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's kind of, and, and that's because it was a lot busier when it was straight through to Hardy. But once you got Montgomery Bell and 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 even. I always point to South Wilson, which is, so it's Montgomery Bell is the next street, and then South Wilson, which is the house, uh, the street my father grew up on. Up until 
even through probably until 1950, South Wilson was paved up to Woodlawn and then a dirt road the rest of the way because there were horse farms here even in the 50s. So there's no movement at all to close it or anything else? Nothing has been approved. I mean, this is this is the first I'm hearing about an easement and first I've heard about closing it. And really it was, he looked into it but didn't really. I think I think they, they're, the Gobers are a little older and probably didn't want to pursue it necessarily until they sold it. It's, it's just deeded and dedicated right away, though. It, it's not. It's my a, understanding. The the street, the street's a real street, for sure. But those easements, that's what popped up today that I don't. I, I need more information on. So. And then, can I just ask one question? Because again, I mean, I'm, I am familiar with this area, but um, not don't live there. Um, what is the emphasis on the house for the from the neighbors that I've heard? Um, emphasis on the house, on the triangle corner facing Innsworth. I'm wondering why is Innsworth the one that's just because that's the way the house is always faced? Is that why? That or because, oh, you know, the argument was that'd be the only house on Innsworth with few houses that would not face Innsworth, but then if, we, if it orients that way, it's the only house on Woodlawn not facing Woodlawn. I, so that's my question. Why is Innsworth being, being singled out superseded like that? Uh, over Woodlawn in, so, the neighbor's, in the neighbor's eyes? So to kind of virtual so where the maulers live so Innsworth place is here and then there is a lot that goes about the same length as as this these three lots together mm -hmm. where the maulers live Real quick, can and you that's where they're that, um, oh yeah that might be there you'll probably have that don't need my illustration visual. Visual. <laughs> can't, you, can't you see my imagination <laughs> Sean I think you want to go back that, that one here? is that what you want that's probably the closest that one. Um, there is it. No. This one? Yeah, yeah I think that one. So you can see this is, so this is um, Innsworth School. Mm -hmm. This is um, where the Mallers live, and they face this way. The home that, you, well, you can see it here, but when I looked at it more in person, we were, it straddles these two here. Um, all of these homes do face this way, and it's always been kind of thought of as kind of here's a stop. All of these homes face each other. All of these homes face each other, and so now, and you hear this a lot with planning, we're going to have the back of the houses, the back of these three houses, facing the side of this one. And where car lights are going to be going and shining into them. But also, it would just be more appropriate if this house, it could either turn, it could be, it could be diagonal. But if you look at the side of this house, it doesn't even address this street whatsoever. And I believe historically, or at least the homes in a lot of the neighborhoods have those side entrances. And I'm not, I'm not seeing that really a side entrance. And, really almost where you, like when you go to knock on a door and you're not sure if you, your front door or the side door, that's the way this should look. That's the way most of these houses look is they've got those two entrances. So, okay, and you. again, having this, any type of more than one curb cut here, it, it's just, I think it's irresponsible and, and out of character with the rest. So. Thank you, council member. Is there anyone else before rebuttal by the applicant. Anyone else? Okay. Applicant, would you like to, we might have some questions for you as well concerning that easement. Yeah. And when it comes to the easement, can I talk about that when I present for the other house? And just just talk about it in general. Go, go ahead on. This is specific. Is that is that easement for this property? That, it's going to be a for the Ah, 3964. Okay. We're taking them all together so we can just yeah. Yeah, respond. Yeah. Go, go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, so each of these three lots has been legally recreated. Closed. Come closer. Sorry. So each of these three lots has been legally recreated. They're closed. They've changed hands. And so the lot that's on the corner of Montgomery Bell and Woodlawn, it needs a curb cut. And I know folks may not want to see a curb cut on Montgomery Bell, but it's better than another one on Woodlawn. And to have one for the garage and for some guest parking is no different than uh, Ms. Newton's house right across the street. Um, and in terms of setbacks, we were allowed to do 40 feet and we agree that's too close. And so we pushed this one back to 53 feet. Um, what about the easement? So the easement has been approved by Public Works and we have not heard anything about having to go to council about that. Council member, did you hear that? I have not heard that from Public Works. Typically with other easement abandonment things, okay. that goes through council. So it might be approved by public works and then it goes through council to either shift an easement or get a new easement or abandon an easement. Okay. So, 
but it's a it's a sewer easement that's being relocated. Um, okay. So my hope today would be that each of these will be voted on individually, and if we get to the corner one that has the easement, and you're just not comfortable, you know, voting without get, having a definitive answer on that, even though I feel like if we had to go to council, we would have heard that by now. Um, we, we would at least like to get a vote on the first two houses because they are individual lots at this point. They've already been yes. subdivided. Mm -hmm. and would, would you address the orientation issue and your yes. thoughts on that? Okay. Of uh, 3964? Yeah. So this may be the most interesting lot I've ever come across with that multiple fronts, little triangle piece there. Mm -hmm. And so in the zoning ordinance, your house is required to face the narrower side, the, the shorter lot line, which in this case is right here. And so knowing that and also getting staff recommendation, that's how we did it. And there would be some interesting things that would happen if we rotated it to face Ensworth. At that point, that you would have a block face there, and then there would be a contextual setback based on the four closest houses there. And so your front setback, Ensworth, can be there more or less, and you'll have a 20 foot rear setback, and your building envelope gets pinched down quite a bit there. And then on top of that, you're not going to want to see the front loaded garage. That's not the thing to do an overlay. So the garage, the driveway needs to be here for public works. So that'd be a side loaded garage. So we'd be 30 feet off the property line for your turnaround, 25 feet off for your garage, then another 20 feet for your breezeway, and then finally we can get to the house here. So we have this lot that's two thirds of an acre, and our house is going to be stuck in that little corner there, um, which I think at that point it fits neither Ensworth or the other house we proposed in Woodlawn. Okay. Um, anything else you want to add? Um, is that 23 seconds or we're good? We got to ask him. Okay. Any other questions to look at? There? No, not, not yet. <laughs> I guess just uh, the deferral, if you would be interested in deferring, just to kind of get the uh, easement um, cleared out for sure. Yeah, for the I think for the corner lot, that would be, and yes, we'd be fine deferring the corner lot. We would prefer on the other two lots since we have a staff recommendation for approval and since the easement does not touch those lots, we would ask for a vote deferral. on that. The deferral on 3964? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Okay. All right. Well. We're going to close public hearing. Thank you. Oh, real quick, is that 3964? 3964. 3964. Okay. Numbers go kind of 3956 on far. Just for clarity for the commissioner. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'll say, I thought yeah, it was the end. Maybe she's there over there. I'll go to spawn that time. The one with the yellow swag. The one with the, the oh, easement? Oh, it's one of the last ones. Yeah. Oh, with the easement? No, I'm going the wrong way. That's, that shows the numbers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay, so it's just oriented. Oh, it's oriented, yeah. that's why, yeah. got it. Okay. All right, so we're closing public hearing. And there is discussion uh, specific to 3956 Woodlawn Drive. The only point I wanted to make was uh, I do agree with the idea of the continuity of the setback should be um, should be thought. You know, even though the district is just this area, I I do agree with the public comment that you know when you're going down Woodlawn, you don't want this you know, mm -hmm. setting out, you know, I don't, I, I think, you know, from a community standpoint, from a neighborhood, that would just look weird and people are trying to figure out why is this one this way and um, that would, I think, kind of um, 
be adverse to what we really want their story, you know, uh, overlay to, you know, to resonate, I guess, that all of a sudden these houses are sitting out and there's not, uh, and we just, are, you know, had to look hard to find where it would. So as far as the setbacks to Woodlawn, I, I agree that I think they should follow the same um, setbacks as the rest of Woodlawn. Brian, I'd ask you, when you look at the map though, the properties that are set back further along Woodlawn, they have deeper lots. So even still, it's just uh, how, you know, when you're driving down in the context of it, unless you're in a helicopter, you don't know about that bigger lot. So I, I guess I just feel like on that, from that standpoint, it, you know, I had it just a minute ago, it, at least, which I think would be a good rule, is if it at least had the same setback from Woodlawn that the existing house has, which is, I'll admit it's a little further up, but at least it's pretty close to the same, um, you know, some some kind of way that it uh, has a continuity of the rest of the street, I think is good. Is it possible? Commissioner Tibbs, I'm, I'm having trouble split the baby on this one. Um, there's so many competing interests that are figuring out how to split the baby on this one. There's so many competing interests with buildings that are in the district, um, a big school that's adjacent, another big school that's down the street, and R10 development that's nearly in its backyard, um, and Kempelong, which is part of the district, directly adjacent, um, or adjacent enough. Um, how, how to reconcile both the shorter lot and the orientation, and I, I don't, I don't think we're going to make everybody happy that's spoken here today. We may not make anybody happy that's spoken here today, but even the house that is on what appeared to, what, what was a single lot didn't meet any of the things that we're talking about or that anyone has, has mentioned. It, it was set back further than the houses along Innsworth, and it, while it addressed Innsworth, it didn't meet the setbacks along Woodlawn, and so that there's already a difference there with the existing condition, even though uh, when we're talking about setbacks, what is the pattern of development? Um, it's pretty difficult to say it's something. Th this is the part where it all transitions. Uh, and, and I think even across Montgomery Bell, some of the arguments begin to fall apart in that well, which one should that address? Uh, we, it's, it's a difficult scenario. So I, I it certainly needs an appropriate setback, but I think to, to draw that line along Woodlawn, this is the point it w in, the, in the neighborhood and the planning and, and where the grid breaks apart where it's, it's harder for me to come to that conclusion. Um, I'm not advocating that everybody have the same trouble with me, but I, I, it's harder for me to come to that conclusion with an appropriate setback. I think I have to recognize the people that have spoken. Uh, you know, it, it is a beautiful neighborhood. I've lived in that neighborhood 40 years. And, and it is hard to see changes in that neighborhood. I remember when uh, Woodlawn and Bowling had four houses, all beautiful, huge houses, three of those now surrounded by other houses. And seeing that go away was hard, uh, you know, but it was within the rights of the, of the homeowners. Uh, the, um, as you go down Woodlawn now, what you see is that there's an abrupt change where South Wilson comes in. So the houses on the north side of Woodlawn, on the other side of South Wilson, have a setback that's probably not as much as what's being proposed here. Once you pass South Woodlawn, then the houses set back, the lots are deeper. But I, I would say that for this neighborhood, you know, a lot of it's not, uh, not within the conservation overlay, but they're gonna have continuing challenges. This is 1.66 acres among these three lots. There are at least four lots that are two and a half plus acres now. And so as development pressure continues to evolve, uh, this neighborhood is going to continue to see even greater challenges, I think, than what we're seeing here. So I, I have to agree with Dana. I think the setback is something that 40 feet is required. They're providing 53. That seems appropriate to me for, for the setback of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I mean, the, as far as the, uh, you know, I don't, we're not specifically discussing the triangle one at the moment for, due to the easement, but, you know, when it was one lot, the house faced the shorter side. And now that it has, you know, been legally split into, into the three, 
you know, I, I guess that's just an unfortunate consequence of that not, you know, whenever it happened, you know, not being consolidated, you know, and, and like a, every other house. So, I mean, that is an unfortunate consequence, but, you know, again, even the original home, you know, faced the shorter side, and then now that they're split, that's kind of the new reality, you know, so, you know, I understand that. Um, as, yeah, as far as the setbacks, again, you know, we don't know, I don't, you know, I, it's hard to say what it would be, you know, if we kept it the same, you know, obviously you don't want it just contrasting greatly, but since we don't even know what those are, you know, they're not in the overlay. Um, yes, it's one street um, continuous, but that would just be hard to just arbitrarily um, make that call for every, you know, house to be that same setback on Woodlawn. Um, for these new these new lots new lot sizes um so that those are my thoughts on that but i don't know if we move i mean i don't know if we talk about individual the two individual ones now or what how do we want to you know the actual size and yeah. massing yeah. and the curb cut you know issues for the for the corner one the on montgomery bell yeah the corner yeah. 3956 woodland so oh. i don't know public i gotta go back into that one huh? public hearing oh, yes okay. Yes, public hearings closed. Um, other, Commissioner Boyd, David, Elizabeth, do you have any comment? Well, if, if we defer that one lot and they find out they can't move the easement, that will, will that affect the other two? Mm -hmm. is, is the building of the other two? What if they say we can't move that easement? I would argue legally no, but I'm not a lawyer. What, what, what? I said I, don't, I would argue legally, not their lots. They exist, and if they meet the guidelines. But, but if there's an easement that can't be moved. Not on the two lots. The easement does not touch the two. The I two understand, but houses. how does it, this is all one project that's being proposed to us by the same builder, and if he doesn't get. He's made three individual applications. Well, my question is, is if what happens to the, other the easement can't get moved, will that affect him building the other two? May or may not. Can we recognize Can I, that? Would you Can like I ask to? ask him that? Wait, wait, okay, so yes, the commissioner has asked that you come back, so please do. So it would not impact these two lots. We would have to redesign the corner lot to okay. fit within okay. the easement at that point. Good okay. question. Good question. Thank you for the answer. Yeah. Okay, just do you have, which, what's your, What's your thoughts that you might want to just share? Well, I certainly, I, I appreciate the applicant for following the guidelines and getting it to this point. I also respect what the residents have expressed both today and then in writing uh, prior to this meeting. So in terms of how to move forward, I'm, I'm still trying to process. I want to follow the rules, but we also want to make sure that we're not creating something in which the other residents are, are thoroughly displeased with the commission and with the applicant with the project and then with the people that will be moving into the homes as well so i would i'm still trying to gather the details in my mind and process questions that i have for you personally i do i like the project but i want to make sure that it is following as many of the guidelines as possible and that we have all the details that was a great question i was curious about that as well in terms of how that impacted if one is denied as is and you have the other two would you consider consolidating or making or adjusting all three and creating two lots or how would you want to, to proceed with that so thank you for your answer in that respect too yeah the question for um staff and maybe legal can weigh in on well staff you'll you can determine what is meant by historic buildings in the guidelines um under 2b c the setback established by Jason historic buildings um with buildings outside of the district, I know when, when Metro under the underlying zoning establishes that, there, there are rules that don't um, split between this or that. It, it just, each parcel is its own thing. In, in this case, this is a district and it ends at Montgomery Bell. Does the house adjacent to that, is it historic? Does it matter if it's in or out of the districts? Would the staff give deference to, does the staff give deference to that uh, in, in considering it historic or not historic? 
Okay. We were discussing who's going to take that question, so I'll, I'll go ahead and take a stab at it. Um, I, I saw that as well, and when looking at it, I was interpreting that to mean either in the historic overlay district or it could be that a, a if there's some other sort of overlay that's just, it's not maybe a district, but perhaps it has some type of historic overlay on that structure, then I think you could you could consider that as well. So I think it has to be one of the two though. It has to be either, a, if it's a structure outside the district, maybe it's got um, you know historic home event or something like that on it, where it's not necessarily in a district, but it may have um, some type of historical um, designation. Right. And in, in that case, I think you could consider it, and I think you should consider it. Um, I think you, you don't have to consider that if it's not that case. So we, here you could, I think you're well within your purview to limit your evaluation to those that are in the, in the district. I think you're in technical compliance with the law when you do that. That said, I don't think you have to do that. I think you can take into consideration the entire street if that's what you, you, you think is appropriate. Related question, is this area uh, included in any kind of National Register Historic District? Not that I'm aware of, um, but I'd have to look up. Yep. One other point I wanted to bring up, I, I knew it was one of my commissions we've already kind of dealt with on the Planning Commission, but Woodlawn is a street that had come up before on another case where this front yard was something that we all kind of felt that was we needed to respect, uh, and this is, this is the planning commission part of it and on a development that was proposed further down. And one of the things was that setback. So I guess that's why this immediately caught my eye that we're already, for something that we talked a lot about, we're already starting to try to break it as it gets further down. So I still kind of stand by that, that I feel like that there's, that you're, and you're right, um, there's a lot of change that's happening, but there's still a lot of rules that we could, should uh, continue on as far as how the street is set back. And I mean, that street, that's, I, mean, I drive down that street every day too. And it's, the, that front yard is one of the um, important kind of features of that um, community. So I, I would still stand behind that, that setback is important. So, you know, just all of a sudden we're gonna pull these up forward I mean, you're right, that one house was different that was there, but it was one lot at that time, too. Now we're putting three lots on it, and by, um, you know, that, that's legally they can do that, but let's, let's try to keep the continuity of the street as still how I feel pretty strongly about. <laughs> okay, with that said, Commissioner, let's just re rehash that a second. Um, Melissa, so the setbacks of these new constructions, are they within the setbacks that we're assumptions um, that are not, you, you know, there hasn't been a rigid? Well, I guess well, the way staff approached it when, when meeting with the applicant was, um, you know, acknowledging that there's across, you know, on the, on the other side of Ensworth and on the other side of Woodlawn, there isn't any houses. There aren't any houses facing Ensworth. Um, those those across Montgomery Bell, there are houses um, facing Ensworth, but because they have a deeper, yeah. they're deeper, deeper lot. lots that they have it might setback. create issues in terms of getting a detached garage and other uh, other ways of meeting the design guidelines. So that was kind of mm -hmm. staff's thinking in terms of thinking that the front setbacks could be pushed up a little bit more um, in order to allow for kind of other other design guidelines guidelines we have like detached garages. You know, I guess the other thing too was our commission usually, we're, we're very clear on we are specific to a site. So when we review our projects, we go, this is site specific. So I know it's a real challenge for us because, you know, how do we make it the rhythm and spacing of the street and then yet have that, like you said, back to you <laughs> on splitting hairs about it. So um, for, for me, I still feel like the deferring would be, you know, and I know the applicant would have to agree to it, but it would be more appropriate. Even though, um, you know, it's the, the that one with the easement is, we, he's already agreed to defer that one. I mean, but it does, could affect it, how it ends up. Um, you know, we're still, and I know even though we're site selected, we're but clear. what if we have more information? You know, what if I'm splitting hairs here and where they are? 
it's only two feet difference or something, you know, I mean, it'd be good to have a little bit more of the context so the other setbacks along there, so, you know, on the adjacent houses and, uh, you know, just, I, I feel like that we need, if we had a little bit more information, we could even, you know, either, you know, whichever way we decide to move forward. But it, it does seem like we all of a sudden we've got this more information that's needed before we can even decide on the other two, on 3960 or 3956. In, uh, I tend to agree with um, Commissioner because of another project that we review um, down where the Goodwill College was, you know, and how that's been several, yeah. how we view that, it's per per property, but yet it's per project. Yeah. Right. And so, you know, it's kind of challenging for us to say, well, specifically for these two, we're good with that, mm -hmm. but it, it really is a project right. in, in full. I agree. The, the applicant has made individual <laughs> applications for individual parcels. Understood. And so, and we're treating them as individual applications. I, I don't agree with that. And I also okay. think that there's an, we're driving down the street. There's an RM40 right in the corner of our, um, the street beyond to the left of the page, which would be to the west. There's an RM40 dr across the street from Innsworth Elementary School. So that already is not a residential, single family residential project. Then you have a house that's turned and faces Innsworth. Innsworth School is across the street. This is where this, it, it's not cohesive. It's only cohesive from one direction already in, in my read of the site specificity. So I think to put a burden on an applicant or ask them to defer because we don't want to make our choices, I, I'm, I'm not necessarily for that. If more information is not going to change my mind, but that doesn't mean we have to, everybody else has to agree with that. Duly noted, Commissioner. <laughs> Duly noted. Well, um, I agree. I mean, honestly, I agree with Ben and um, on that. And I mean, we can't defer things anyways. So, well, I, I was going to ask again, but I don't know whether y'all were here and about how the body could defer or not. Council. Well, I mean, if, if the applicant is in agreement, then, then you could defer it, but you couldn't defer it on your own motion. Yeah. Right. Yeah. The applicant would have to agree. I have to agree. Okay. Okay, well, is someone ready to make a motion on 3956 Woodlawn Drive? Well, I think on that one, there's also the issue of, um, I mean, I guess we haven't really discussed the structure um, nor the request for a secondary curb cut. Um, I mean, I'm, I don't think that. Yeah, he, uh, so. Uh, didn't the applicant request a second one but for that's a guest parking? A, that's not on the recommendation. Yeah. It is. Yeah. It oh, is. Uh, yes, okay. let, me, let me actually pull up that. All right. Um, <laughs> Just stay there. I think we don't help ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> so for this one, just to remind commissioners, um, for Montgomery Bell and Woodlawn, they are proposing the second curb cut up towards the front of the house. Staff recommended that it be back behind the house. No. Um, so that was staff's recommendation. Obviously, the commission can discuss and determine if that's appropriate. Your objection is not to the second curb cut, but the location of the parking pad? Mm-hmm. Number six. OK. I, mean, well, well, I believe the applicant did say that he wanted parking in the front. On 3956? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Okay, why don't we try making the motion and let's see how we vote. Okay. Are we ready to make the vote? No, I mean, I'd like to discuss the parking okay. pad. Okay. Let's, right? discuss, I mean, let's discuss the parking uh, pad. Oh. oh, okay. Somebody can make, I'm, I'm, I'm not making a motion. But. Okay. <laughs> All right. I mean, are we against a second parking pad altogether? What? I mean, they seem now, if we put it in the back, they're right next to each other, right? Is that not mm -hmm. how I'm reading this? Yeah, that's I mean, they're right next to each other. If you move that little red 
Yeah. Yeah. Like it. Well, no, no. So they're requesting it where it's drawn. Yeah. And staff has requested they move it back, but then it's essentially right next to the garage. Mm. So that's too. I don't know. I just. I think. Yeah, I don't think there needs to be two, in my opinion. But, Commissioner, I, I, I thought that the applicant said that he disagreed with that because it was too far to walk around to get to the front door, and so he wanted one in the front. Is that correct? Could I? Yeah. Okay, oh, yeah, I time. definitely don't like the one in the front. I think that's what he was yeah. okay. requesting. Uh, are we okay with him yeah. coming back? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, staff recommended that we locate the guest parking on the back half of the house, and we are fine with that. Okay. Right. So, excuse okay. me. Good. Okay. So number six is good. But I mean, I still don't know if I like the two. <laughs> so they would prefer it in the front where it's drawn, the, the pin square coming off the street. Mm -hmm. Staff okay. is, you know, I rightly so. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I agree with staff if there was going to be two mm -hmm. to move it back, because mm -hmm. I definitely don't agree with it as drawn and as, as wanted by the applicant. You know, I understand the need, but I don't, I don't think it works. Um, but okay. I just don't know if I agree with the two okay. is my, yeah. that was what I was trying to sure. talk about, see what everyone else I get thought. It now. Can I address that issue further? Um, I, yeah, I, I think we should just hold mm -hmm. off. I think we've had enough of, you know, enough information. So in further discussion, just on the parking pad, I, I think where the staff has suggested it um, is a good 30 feet from the driveway, the edge of the driveway. and. Um, could you whip in and sort of park parallel to the street? You could. Um, I would. I would argue that. Um, I, I would argue that a second curb cut would be less obtrusive than just that additional mass of paving without a landscaping break on Montgomery Bell. But uh, that's not a hill I, I need to. Uh, okay. I need to die on. But uh, certainly it would. It would be a lot more if they were connected in appearance. In my opinion. Yeah, I guess I didn't think about them just being connected. I was just thinking of cutting Single. one. And yeah, so but then if they just connected it, then that would okay. be worse. Right. I'll okay. start off with the motion. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Shut down. Okay. <laughs> we'll see what happens. I recommend disapproval for 3956 uh, based on the setback and the rhythm of spacing along uh, Woodlawn Drive. And um, I don't know where the actual thing would be for the, but uh, the, the relationship to also Montgomery Bell. I'll use that same one for that. So you're disapproving staff recommendation? Yes, for 39. Okay. There is a motion to disapprove staff recommendation by Brian Tibbs. Is there a second for that? Second. There is a second. All in favor of the motion? Aye. Uh, All those opposed to the motion? Okay. So that motion doesn't pass. <laughs> Sorry. Hey, that's my first so motion in 10 minutes. <laughs> so good. <laughs> Did I? <laughs> uh, um, is there another motion? I'll move um, with respect to 30, the application for 3956 Woodlawn Drive um, approval, noting that um, the setback meets the, the guidelines in 2B. C um, and that all of the conditions um, by staff be met here too. Okay, so Commissioner Mosley has made a motion. Is there a second? Second. second. Um, either <laughs> commissioners. Uh, all in favor of that motion? Aye. Aye. And how many of those, please? Raise your hands. Mm -hmm. So Melissa has that. So Elizabeth, I'm sorry, you're voting for against that motion. I'm sorry, could, could I see who's in favor of it again? <laughs> Where's Mr. Tibbs? Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. That was okay. And those opposed? Two. All right. We have two oppositions. So the motion passes, which means we are in line with staff recommendation. Clear? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Shall we move forward? We shall. <laughs> okay. Um, 3960. It's 256 right? Or excuse me, we did, yeah, sorry. 3960 is the middle lot. Let's just get really clear on that. Um, 3964 Woodlawn is deferred, so this is the middle lot. 
Um, Did we officially defer that, or do we have to? We, I think the, the we'll have to vote. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah the, the applicant uh, deferred it. Um, since we've had discussion, do we need we more discussion? <laughs> Yeah, on 3960 Woodlawn. I guess we'll do that next. We'll do that next. Okay. Well, let's review the recommendation from staff, and if we have any questions and discussions on that, please speak. I have no further no. comment. Okay. Commissioner Price has no further comment. Anyone else? Or make a motion. Commissioner. With respect to 3960 Woodlawn Drive, I make the motion that we approve staff recommendation with um, the attached conditions. There is a motion. Is there a second? Second. Uh, Commissioner Boyd, a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposition? Two oppositions. All right. And the motion passes. Okay. Um, it is now uh, four o'clock. Should we take a short break? Are you good? Hold on. I'm sorry. Yes. The applicant has agreed to defer that one, yeah, but because you right, okay, you have already had a public hearing. Yes. We need to take some action to defer Absolutely. officially based on the applicant's agreement to defer. Okay. Should somebody make that motion? Then? Okay. So um, the applicant has. Um, um, it would like to defer 3964 Woodlawn Drive. Um, is there a motion? I still move. Okay, Commissioner Stewart has Second. made the motion. Second. And all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, any opposition? No opposition. So we will defer. Thank you very much for counsel. Um, do we need to take a break or we're good to go for two more? We have CLG training today as well. Can we take a break? Yeah, let's take a break. Okay. I think we're taking a break. <laughs> okay, we'll take a uh, let's take a five minute break. Ms. Jenny, 4406 Elkins Avenue. Okay. So 4406 Elkins Avenue is a non-contributing structure that sits mid-block in the Park Elkins Neighborhood Conservation Zoning Overlay. A staff permit has been issued for its demolition. The proposed infill is a one-and-a-half-story front gabled house with shed dormers on either side. 
This block of Elkins Avenue contains one-story houses, all of which are considered contributing, except the one being demolished. The three houses seen here are all across the street. This house, the pink one is our subject lot. This house sits to the immediate right of the subject property and is oriented toward the corner. The back of that side addition to the far left there, um, that will face the new construction. These three houses sit to the immediate left of the subject property. They are all very similar in terms of height, width, depth, form, and setback. We happen to have scale drawings of the house at 4412 Elkins due to a recent renovation. So when you compare the width as seen here and the depth as seen here to the proposed, the infill is appropriate and compatible. Staff's primary concern is with the height. I've tried to create sort of an accurate scaled streetscape here just to give you a feel. Um, so these really here on the left, there's three houses exactly that size. Um, then we have our subject proposed infill, and then on the left, there's the approximate height of that gable as it would measure against the proposed infill. Try not to bog you down with too many numbers during the hearing. I know those are all in your report, but just kind of wanted to give you a visual of the impact of the height on that streetscape. So the proposed height is about 28 feet tall, um, and that would make the infill about nine feet taller than those three houses on the left. Um, and an estimated about two and a half, maybe three feet taller than that non-historic side addition there on the right. So staff is requesting that the overall height be pulled down to at least 26 feet, which would be about the height of that red line there. So still taller, um, but we feel like it would respect uh, just the height of the streetscape a little bit better. Um, then on the left elevation, one of the dormers is only about half glazing. The guidelines record, require that dormers be primarily glazing. So we would recommend that a second window be added in this location. Further, all groups of windows should be separated by the four to six inch mullions as usual. Um, and that's, that's it for the infill. Then moving on to the outbuilding, the height, square footage, design, and roof all meet the guidelines. Staff recommends staff level approval of the materials prior to purchase and installation. And then in conclusion, <coughs> staff is recommending approval of the proposed infill and garage with the following conditions. That the height of the house shall be reduced to a maximum of 26 feet. The front setback of the house, which I didn't really talk a lot about, but we just want to split that difference between the historic house to the left and the side elevation of that corner home to the right. The finished floor height shall be consistent with the finished floor heights of the adjacent historic houses. Um, it is drawn that way. A second window shall be added to the dormer on the left elevation. Staff will approve the final materials of the house. Staff will approve the final materials of the <coughs> garage. All grouped windows shall be separated by four to six inch mullions, and the HVAC shall be located behind the house or on either side beyond the midpoint of the house. Um, and I did meet with the applicant yesterday. They are um, amenable to trying to bring down the height. They might, they said they might need to get a little more depth um, to do that. We would be okay with working those details out with them if you guys would be okay with that as well. Okay. Any questions? And just real quickly, Jenny. I yeah. In the presentation, I think you said that the proposed height is 28 feet and uh -huh. you wanted down to 20. In the staff report I'm reading, it says 31 feet. Oh, never mind. Why? <laughs> What's that? Gotcha. <laughs> Nothing. Okay. Good. <laughs> okay. Good. I didn't want to go down yeah. the line. Height. Um, yeah. In in looking at the sort of we don't see the house in elevation. Yeah. And maybe this is a, less of an issue. Um, it may not be as big an issue, but I, if you bring it down two feet, the pitch of the dormers sort of meet. There's n there's not a visual separation between how you know the dormers are meeting very close to the peak of the well, roof. Well, I'm not saying just lop it off. No, I mean, <laughs> even, even if you of, make it lower, right, it right. it strikes a different profile. Um, and I, I would right. So some 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 uh, thought just so that the the house looks right, if you will, and the proportions of the dormers are correct and proper. That those not a dormer that meets at the roof is, right. in my mind, is very different when one that meets lower down on the roof. Um, well, and that's kind of how we got to this, to where we are. Mm -hmm. um, our, the initial submission had some, we asked for some revisions, they made those revisions, and that grew our height a little bit. So mm. I, definitely when you change one thing, it affects other things. Um, so yes, if it, if it goes a little bit lower, we do recognize <coughs> that's going to change some other things. 
one of the things we would be okay with is a little bit more depth. Um, but yeah, I wouldn't want to see a whole lot more width because this width is very consistent with the streetscape. Um, it, those are some issues we would love for you to address. Okay. Is the applicant here? They are. Okay. Would you yeah. like to speak? No, I think she's spoke everything. Okay. The applicant is motioning that he will work with staff. Okay. Correct. Gotcha. All right. Um, open public hearing. Is there anyone here to speak? No. Closed public hearing discussion. Make a motion to approve 4406 Elkins Avenue uh, with staff recommendations. Commissioner Sorry. Tibbs, second by Stewart. Commissioner Stewart. And uh, all in favor of the motion? Aye. 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 Okay. Uh, none opposed. So the motion passes. Thank you very much. And 1723 Fifth Avenue North. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, this is the last item on the agenda today for discussion, and uh, we can, uh, I think, re close the recording afterwards, but there will stick around for a training uh, from Jessica Reeves, Metro Historical Commission staff member. So this last case uh, is uh, 1723 Fifth Avenue North in the Salem Town Neighborhood Conservation Zoning Overlay. It's an application to construct infill on a lot where there is currently a non-contributing house. The house, uh, at least when I took this picture, uh, was still standing, but a demolition permit has been issued. Uh, it was issued a couple months ago. The, oh, well, there's a shot of uh, the house and a new construction to the left that the commission approved uh, 2013 or 14. And um, again, the non-contributing house and to the right of it is a bit of a, a it's not a lot, but a, a side yard of a commercial building that actually is on the corner, a corner, corner commercial that has a, like a barber shop in it, I believe. So uh, there is the uh, front elevation of the proposed new construction. New construction, as you can see, it'll be a two-story building. Uh, the total height of the building is 31 and a half feet. Um, primary width of the building is 29 and a half feet uh, with projections on the left and right side increasing the total width to 35 feet. Uh, the height is compatible uh, with the surrounding context and meets the guidelines 35 up to 35 feet is allowed for height in German or Salem town and the width is compatible with historic houses. Uh, staff would recommend that the front setback is consistent with the adjacent house, actually the adjacent non-historic house, we usually ask for uh, setbacks to match historic context. Um, there are no one, if any, historic houses left on the on this block face. It's uh, dominated by construction that was done just before the overlay. So um, matching the adjacent house is most appropriate. And we'd also uh, ask to verify that the floor height is compatible with uh, surrounding houses, that's a sort of a standard inspection. Uh, the depth of the house is uh, 87 feet front to back. Uh, it is rather long, but it is broken up sufficiently with um, articulating and projecting bays. Uh, also, uh, as it is a duplex, the f left and right units are offset about eight feet. And uh, so that, the, the articulations and bays, the, the front porches, uh, front and rear porches being offset all, all help to break up the massing. Uh, it'll be very compatible with the, the uh, adjacent building. Um, staff finds essentially the height and massing to be appropriate. Uh, standard uh, infill materials including uh, cement fiber siding, um, asphalt shingle roof, split face block. Uh, staff would ask to approve the roof color window and door selections, those are also standard conditions. Um, I guess there's the rear elevation and to sum it all up, staff recommends approval of the proposed two-story infill at 1723 Fifth Avenue North <coughs> with the conditions that the front setback is consistent with the setback of adjacent houses. 
um, that the finished floor height is consistent with the finished floor height of uh, nearby houses relative to grade, that the window and door selections are approved by staff, that the roof color shall be approved by staff, uh, also that a front walkway is added from the front porches to the front sidewalk, uh, and that the utility connections are behind the midpoint of the building or on at the rear. Uh, meeting all those conditions, <coughs> staff finds this proposal meets guidelines for new construction in the Salem Town Neighborhood Conservation Zoning Overlay. And Sean, question orientation. Um, across the street, is that block under the overlay? Yes, okay. both sides of the street are, are in the overlay. And so are there contributing structures across the street? Uh, there are some, There, uh, even the house two doors down to the left is technically contributing. Yes. Uh, but it's been very significantly altered um, somewhat before the overlay and even after the overlay. We issued a permit that wasn't exactly followed. Yeah, we remember that house. Yeah, you remember that one. Um, there is context, historic context around, but it's not, not the strongest historic context. Yes. Okay. Sean Staff does. looked at all of that and we did find it to be more or less uh, in keeping with for certainly what, what's what been approved. For clarity on the front setback, so in the adjacent lot, it's got an offset. The frontmost part of yes. that lot or the frontmost part of that mass would meet the frontmost path. That, that's how that would be interpreted in the field. That's how I was thinking, mm -hmm. picturing it. Okay, any other questions for Sean? Uh, is the applicant here? Would you like to come and speak since you waited to the very last yeah. minute? <laughs> okay. Um, other than you will agree with staff recommendation? Yeah, I've already looked at it. They just just agree with Okay. All right. We just want to make that, uh, yeah, make that uh, recording. Okay. Um, open public hearing, closed public hearing. And do we have discussion or motion? Uh, Madam Chairman, I move for approval uh, with staff conditions. Okay. Commissioner Stewart's made a motion. Yeah. Second. Oh, oh, who's made the second? Brian, <laughs> Brian Tibbs has made the second. <laughs> All in favor of the motion. Aye. Aye. And there's none opposed, so the, the motion passes. Thank you. All right. Before you close the meeting, uh, I did want to make, we won't a, close. Before you make a statement that uh, Nashville lost one of our giants in Michael Emery yes. um, a few weeks ago. And uh, for many of you online I haven't heard about it, but he, uh, he was, he's been probably more instrumental, especially in the, I would say, the early days of the, um, uh, the historic preservation being a, a leader in so many things. And he was one of my first mentors in it. So I just wanted to make sure that on this historic commission that we paid note to that. and. Uh, I, I think there's going to be some later uh, arrangements and we'll make that, but right now I just want to make sure that that was stated uh, before we dismiss today. Should we have a little moment? Is it appropriate? Uh, it's up to the chair. I don't, it's up to you as chair, well, but you, you I just wanted to make sure that, yeah. that the point was out there. That's the most yeah. important thing. I think that's well said, and he was a, um, yes, he was an institution as well. Yeah. So Thank you for that. Michael Emmerich, thank you. Um, do we close and then we do? Yeah, yeah okay. So we are closing our session for the, for the day. Yes, move. Okay, move do we move? Adjourn. Yes, second? Okay, second. We're closed. This has been a service of the Metro National Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.